He's journeyed 9,000 kilometers to be with us. He's done TED Talks in the USA. He's collaborated with Nobel Prize winning scientists on his project, the Xenotext Experiment, to inject poetry into the hardest bacteria known to humankind. So that after we've been obliterated by nuclear and atomic Armageddon, his poetry will outlive us all. He's had a top 10 best-selling book in the UK, competing with Harry Potter. He's won Canada's highest poetry award, the $50,000 Griffin Prize for Poetic Excellence. His book, Yonoya, the shortest word in the English language, which includes all five vowels, A-E-I-O-U, was described by our very own Charles Brandreth as extraordinary, outrageous, irresistible, a must for verbivores. He is Christian Bach. We didn't want an ordinary introduction. We didn't, we, we didn't want an ordinary introduction for Canada's leading poet, so we invited one of England's best young poets, Hannah Silver, to come here tonight to introduce Christian Bogg. However, as it happens, Hannah has been shortlisted for the prestigious Ted Hughes Award for New Work in Poetry, which will be announced right about now in London. So Hannah left our conference this afternoon at 3 p.m. with all our very best wishes going with her to attend the award ceremony in London. But as a true pro, she didn't want to let us down, so she pre-recorded this very special three-minute introduction to Christian Bock. The lines are the lines of are the lines of cutting are the lines of cutting are entirely arbitrary arbitrary. <laughs> The lines, the lines, the lines, the lines, the lines, the lines, the lions, 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 yes, the lions, the lions, yes, the lions roar. It could begin this way. Here, just like that. Just like Jay us ill ply ink upon a taste. Just to see whether or not the poem can actually express itself as a viable protein. Why hire a poet to write a poem when the poem can in fact write itself? Sinus, 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 sinus
Christian, 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 but 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 Dédicage by R. Murray Schaefer. Tau fo murium, tau fo te lulsk, tau fo te lemet ne te chonk lels, tau fo saed nad hissigant, a heave no sheer daf sith tumkos fo sid wor fo you. No wisteting a ti tel fo ti ta mi te. E si te royu losims, royu urte can fissigans how to dine for sequenti neth. Thine of a sequen woe, te sulping larite, fo you load of dowel now wed, meko bear and cone fo rumben remek. As a ver rough royo daffed mobile, a raxed raj for urgo, a bumped shupetau, av murim tau of te lulsk, tau of te lamet nad te chunk lels, tau of side nad hissigant, a heaven of sheer daff, sit tumkos of sidwar of fo you, no wisting a tea tell of it at me te, e sith er royo losums, royo urte, can physicans, how to thine of us quenit neth, thine of us quen wo, te sulping larite of me lu. Thou will know it make obe a rencone of remben remek As ave rof royu daffed mobile A raxed raj of urgo A bum shupid the pout of murim out of the lul scout of the lamet and the chunklils Out of side and tisigant I have an assured of situmkos of said word for you No wisteting a teetal of it at me te E sit royu losims Royu urte can significance how to thine nervous quen it neth thine nervous quen how the souping larite of my elu thou will one day make obea rancone of remben remek a save for royu daffid mobile a raxed jar of urigo a bump chup but the pout of Murium out of the lulsk, out of the lame at end the chunklels, out of days and hissigant, I have no sheer daft this tumkos of said war for you, no wisteting a detail of it at a time. Eseth are your losims, your true can physicans, how to thine of us knew it then, thine of us knew how the souping larite of my love, thou will one day make obey a rencone of rembem remek, a vase for your daffid mobile, a raxed jar of urgo, a tomb shoop at the pout. Out of murim, out of the skull, out of the lame at end, the can't shell, out of days and hissigant, I have no sheer daft this tumkos of words for you, no wisteting a little of it at a time. These are your losims, your true can physicans, how to thy nervous knew it then, thy nervous knew how the sulping larite of my love would one day make kube a rencone of rembem remek, a vase for your faded bloom, a raxed jar of rouge, a tomb pushed up out of memory, out of the skull out of the helmet and the conch shell, out of days and nights. I have no sheer daft this tumkos of words for you, new wisting a little of it at a time. These are your losims, your true can physicans, though thine of us knew it then, thine of us knew how the souping larite of my love would one day become a rencone of rembem remek, a vase for your faded bloom, a raxed jar of rouge, a tomb pushed up out of memory, out of the skull, out of the helmet and the conch shell. Out of days and nights, I have no sheer death, this costume of words for you, no wisteting a little of it at a time. These are your symbols, your true can physicans, though neither of us knew it then, neither of us knew how the pulsing reality of my love would one day become a rencone of rembem remek, a vase for your faded bloom, a cracked jar of rouge, a tomb pushed up out of memory, out of the skull, out of the helmet and the conch shell, 
Out of days and nights I have fashioned this costume of words for you, untwisting a little of it at a time. These are your symbols, your true significance, though neither of us knew it then. Neither of us knew how the pulsing reality of my love would one day become a container of remembrance, a vase for your faded bloom, a cracked jar of rouge, a tomb. I'm going to uh, read you some excerpts uh, from the book for which I'm probably most notorious, uh, the work entitled Unoia, spelled E-U-N-O-I-A. Unoia is the shortest word in English to contain all five vowels, and the word quite literally means beautiful thinking. Uh, the word was coined by Aristotle to describe the state of mind that you must be in in order to make a friend. Uh, I'm just going to read to you, for now, my favorite paragraph from the entirety of the book. Uh, this is a, an excerpt from Chapter I for Dick Higgins. Writing is inhibiting. Sighing I sit, scribbling in ink this pigeon script. I sing with nihilistic witticism, disciplining signs with trifling gimmicks, impish hijinks which highlight stick sigils. Isn't it glib? Isn't it chic? I fit childish insights within rigid limits, writing shtick which might instill priggish misgivings in critics blind with hindsight. I dismiss nitpicking criticism which flirts with philistinism. I bitch, I kibitz, griping whilst criticizing dimwits, sniping whilst indicting nitwits, dismissing simplistic thinking in which philippic wit is still illicit. Uh, the uh, work owes a great debt uh, to the famous sonnet by Arthur Rimbaud, a sonnet entitled Voyelle, in which of course he discusses the colors of the vowels. I'm going to perform for you a, a handful of translations of this poem. And I'd like to read uh, the original poem by Arthur Rimbaud, and I do apologize to francophones in the audience for my egregious uh, pronunciation. Uh, this is Voyelle by Arthur Rimbaud. Un noir, u blanc, i rouge, u vert, o bleu, voyelle. Je dirai quelque jeu vos naissances, la tonte. Un noir corset velu des muches éclatantes qui bombine autour du pointeur cruel. Golf d'ombre. Eux, quand deux des vapeurs et des tentes lancent des glaciers fiers, roi blond, frisson d'ombelle. Il peuple sans cracher, rire des lèvres belles, dans la couleur ou les ivresses pénitentes. Eux, cycle, vibrement divin des mers virides, paix du pâti sommet d'animaux, père des rides, que l'alchimie imprime au grand front studieux. Ô oh, suprême clairon plein d'esprits d'eux étranges, silence traversé des mondes et des anges, ô oh, l'oméga, rayon violet de ses yeux. Now, it's a very beautiful sonnet. It's an important uh, precedent for many avant-garde poets in the history of experimental writing. I'd like to read to you my relatively straightforward translation of this poem, in which, of course, I preserve the same Alexandrine meter and rhyme scheme. This is vowels. A, black, E, white, I, red, U, green, O, blue, the vowels. I will tell thee one day of thy newborn portents. A, the black velvet cuirass of flies whose essence commingles a buzz around the cruelest of smells, wells of shadow. E, the whitewash of mists and tents, glaives of icebergs, albino kings, frostbit fennels. I, the bruises, the blood spat from lips of damsels who must laugh in scorn or shame, both intoxicants. 
You, the waves, divine vibratos of verdant seas, pleasant meadows rich with venery, grins of ease which alchemy grants the visages of the wise. O oh, the supreme trumpeter of our strange sonnet, quietudes crossed by another world and spirit. O oh, the omega, the violet ray gun of her eyes. Now, I felt that this um, translation, while competent, um, uh, did not, in fact, actually preserve all of the original vowels from the original poem. I thought that it, surely a poem entitled Vowels should at least retain all of the original vowels in exactly the same order in which they appear. So I'm about to read a translation in which, in fact, I have simply swapped out all the consonants and preserved the original vowels in their original order. And yet again, I maintain the Alexandrine rhythm and rhyme scheme. This poem is entitled Phonemes. Phantoms infernal without refuge or return. Phonemes. We will hark if such resurgent souls ordain a dreamt verse. A, offspring of perfect murders, so unseen that stranglers fulfill no crime, and thus mourners must call the unjust schemes overdoses. E, charmed slumber that engulfs the sleepers, cradled by dreamlike sirens who sing mankind forlorn themes. I, corrupted archangel, shriven when mercy redeems all shadowy specters who plunder shipwrecked believers. You, the sphinx beheld by disciples, then by infidels, a riddle that grieves a king, a truth that crippled minstrels must bewail in epics like staunch martyrs whom furies spurn. O oh, untempted saint, who lends this typewritten utterance its fervency, an endless cycle of perseverance. O oh, how the bards abolish symbols when the letters burn. I'm glad that you approved. Okay, uh, uh, thinking that was insufficient. Um, I've uh, also translated the poem using uh, all of the letters that have appeared in the original poem, simply recombined. So uh, you know, the next uh, translation I'm about to read, uh, you've heard all of these letters already, just not in this particular order. Okay? Uh, this is uh, vocables. <laughs> Eternal, you beguile love or ruin, vocables. Jejun vassals, quote, ten codas in reliquaries. A, the ceaseless verses at occult monasteries, requiems of dust, bound to nebulous particles, embers of gold. E, graven urns in sanctuaries, brass bells unsold, decreed priceless for our canticles. I, a senseless verse, a spell garbled in pentacles, choruses deemed perverse in desolate nurseries. You, a universe expressed as a murmur of tides, all its perplexing maxims, exquisite suicides, dim minds transcended by vivid, hexatic prisms. Oh, a vesper stressing serenades or solitudes, a clever muse to generate endless interludes. Oh, my elegiac ode ends in paroxysms. Now, as you might imagine, uh, most of the poems in this book are heavily informed by the precedents already set by the great writer Georges Breck. So, of course, I've included a, a text that's dedicated to him. Uh, this poem is entitled W. Uh, w is, of course, uh, the favorite letter of Georges Breck, uh, who, uh, I think, uh, very coincidentally, admires a consonant uh, that um, imitates a vowel sound 
just as my compadre, a Canadian poet uh, from an earlier generation, B.P. Nichol, has admired the letter H as his favorite letter. These are the two letters that are considered consonants, but that nevertheless make vowel sounds. This is W for Georges Perec. And uh, it's sufficiently pretentious enough to have two <laughs> epigraphs. Uh, the first is by André Breton, who says, to the V that stands for viewing what is all around us, eyes turned outward toward the conscious surface of things, surrealism as relentlessly opposed, W. This next epigraph is from Georges Perec, who says, a meaningless distinction on W leads to automatic disqualification. It is the V you double, not the U. As if to use two valleys in a valise is to savvy the vacuum of a vowel at a powwow in between saw teeth. It is to ask the painter of a watercolor hue, why owe you twice what a sheep is or a tree if the fee you double has to hew you a puzzle? An enigma like a game in E, its jigsaw zigzag never fits the excess void left behind by X, the exit on the way from Y to what is said. If you glean an anagram from each angle, do you dabble with your double view of what you hate? A swastika that awaits your Olympiad of riddles? Is this letter a residuum of what troubles you? If you slice it down the middle, does it not hereafter indicate a twofold victory over life? If it maps the rise and fall of fortune like a yo yo, why yo, why yo, must you find four palm trees in a park if not to make of them your symbol? It is the name for an X whose V does not view the surface of a lake, but the mirror on a wall where you and you become a totonym, a continuum. And finally, I'd like to uh, just read the last paragraph uh, in Unoya. Uh, this is an excerpt uh, from a poem entitled Emended Excess which exhausts uh, the vocabulary not used in chapter E, and it is likewise dedicated to Georges Perec. When freshmen get tested next semester, the nerds, the geeks, even the dweebs, reference dense exegeses, les pensées des esthètes, Hegel, Engels, Frege, Brecht, even Schlegel. Hence these teens get the best degrees. When presses present the next bestseller, Pierrex Les Revenantes, the pressmen kern the lettered elements, then emend the text. The meddlers meddle, the spell checker checks the lexemes, then respells them. Hence, we see selected references get deleted. Nevertheless, Pierrex Creed gets expressed. Nevertheless, Pierrex Tenet gets preserved. E servem lex est. C'est le règlement. The end. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do a, a few uh, uh, quick works of uh, conceptual literature. I have the good fortune to have uh, founded uh, an avant-garde school of writing, and many of my uh, colleagues and friends just so happen to be here today. It's very so these, are, these poems are for them primarily, I think. Um, I'm going to uh, perform for you uh, two texts uh, that are normally presented as uh, large-scale works of art. Uh, uh, they're displayed on billboards, they might be displayed in windows, on the walls of galleries. The important thing to note is uh, that this work has been produced in collaboration with uh, a great Canadian conceptual artist named Michael Lexier. And all you need to know about these two texts is that the first one I'm about to read is by Michael Lexier, my friend, and the second one is in fact by me. The title of this work is Two Equal Texts. This text and the one beside it are equal. I wrote this one first, 
And then I gave it to my friend Christian Book and asked him to generate a new text using every letter and every punctuation mark that I used in mine. The other text is his. Mike Alexier requested in advance that I reinvent his text. So I unknotted it and re-knitted it into this very form. But then I began to think that his message had already re-sown a touted art of genuine poetry. His eerie text was mine. Uh, many years ago, I was um, asked to submit a, an artwork uh, to the Marianne Boski Gallery for uh, an art show called Poetry Plastique. It was my very first New York art show. And uh, for this uh, show, I submitted a book made entirely out of Lego bricks. The text, the pages, the binding, the cover, everything was made out of Lego with no piece bigger than a flat four peg tile. So the most atomistic, granular bits of Lego went into the production of this book, and you could open it and read it just like any other ordinary book of, uh, of poetry. Uh, each page featured a single line of poetry uh, set as a kind of mosaic in these uh, Lego bits. And uh, each line of the poem is in fact an anagram of the title. So just as you could completely dismantle this book and reconstitute it into something else, so also could you do the same thing with each of the uh, lines of poetry. They basically permuted the same fixed set of letters. Uh, this poem is entitled, Ten Maps of Sardonic Wit. And of course, every line, ten lines, uh, in fact, uh, permute that fixed set of letters. Ten Maps of Sardonic Wit. Atoms in space now drift on a swift and epic storm. Soft wind can stir a poem. Snow fits an optic dream into a scant prism of dew. Words spin a faint comet. Some words, in fact, paint two stars of an epic mind. Manic words spit on fate. Now, I actually managed to sell that work, uh, even though somebody could easily have built it themselves. Um, uh, I managed to sell it, and uh, based on the uh, strength and success of that particular contribution, I was invited to uh, create a commission uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of LEGO, and uh, the, you know, the 50th anniversary of the invention of LEGO. And the only constraint was that I had to make use of the text from the actual patent. So this is a, this is a paragraph, uh, a fully quoted paragraph uh, from patent number 3,005,282 uh, by Gert, Gottfried Kirk Christensen, uh, the inventor of Lego, who says, toy elements of this kind will be referred to generally as building bricks and the principal object of the invention is to provide improved coupling means for clamping such building bricks together in any desired relative position, thus providing for a vast variety of combinations of the bricks for making toy structures of many different kinds and shapes. Now, it just so happens uh, that coincidentally, if you take this particular paragraph and repermute, rearrange all of its letters exhaustively, you get this directly quoted paragraph from the great order of the universe by Democritus. <laughs> Atoms bombard the unplumbable void, plunging like silvery raindrops or drifting like twinkly hoarfrost and by coalescing, if kindred, they cause things to appear, and by separating, if opposed, they cause things to vanish. And from these interknit vectors, objects interlock, forever becoming one prolific universe, distinctive for its mild infinitude of forms.
one of the hats I wear as a poet uh, is as a sound poet. And uh, based on the strength of my reputation as a sound poet, I was once invited to uh, participate in the TV show Gene Roddenberry's Earth Final Conflict. I was called upon to design the alien language spoken on that science fiction show. Uh, they employed me for a year before firing me, uh, in part because the actors could not perform uh, their lines in the language. I was somewhat disappointed by this experience, of course. Uh, what I'm going to perform for you now is an alien hymn uh, from the show. I was commissioned to build a song for the show. Uh, unfortunately, I never made it to air. Uh, so this uh, poem is entitled, Valuvialo. Va aviva la valiva lima valima uju uji java ujavi juvata ujuvata iwi iwashimi iwasha ala lilama ala mila miva la miva uv uvivata uvati vutaja uvutaja ishi Isha mi wi isha ma ma Ami ma va ma vi ma vi la ma vi la Utu Uti ta ja uta ji tu ja va utu ja va i mi I ma wi shi i ma wa A va A vi va la va li va li ma va li ma u ju U ji ja va u ja vi ju va ta u ju va ta i wi Iwashimi iwashala Alilama la mi la mi va la mi va uvu Uvivata uvati vutaja uvutaja ishi Ishami uishamama Ami ma va ma vi ma vi la ma vi la utu Uti taja utaji tu java utu java imi Ima wishi, ima wa. Okay, for the uh, remainder of uh, my performance, I think I'm going to uh, perform for you now uh, excerpts uh, from my current uh, work in progress, a uh, work entitled The Xenotext. I have been, in fact, working on this project now for 12 years to the exclusion of anything else. Uh, and I'm still not done. Uh, I'm going to perform for you uh, uh, the opening poem, an excerpt from it. It's not done yet, but an opening salvo uh, from this book. Uh, the title of this poem is The Late Heavy Bombardment. And the poem is about the origins of life on Earth. The Late Heavy Bombardment. Welcome, wraith and reader, to the Hadean Aeon of the Earth. When Myrmidons hurled their cobalt bombs into your molten world of basalt and bronze, when mighty golems swan dough from orbit to drive their glaives of iron into your black mesas only to be engulfed by the blast waves. When meteors fell earthward in droves, each one a gigaton warhead ablaze. When super volcanoes erupted, flam of vomis after each hammer blow from these endless blitzes of aerolites and fire bombs. When bolides of brimstone collided, then exploded into ablative cascades. When tsunamis of lava rained down like napalm, bedrowning the subcontinents. When millions of Molotov cocktails shattered all at once upon the cobblestones of hell. When Trojans berserk with rage stormed over the brink of your abyss, vowing to claw your face from the skull of the moon. What dire seed must these onslaughts have scattered like shrapnel across your cremated badlands? 
What prion, what virus, what breed of spore must have emerged like a spear point or a sword blade from these early ovens of Auschwitz, each cyanide bonfire burning in reverse? spitting forth a fitful embryo cloned from the smoke and the dross. What orchid must have bloomed among the flamethrowers in the furnace? What dragon must have hatched from the burnt teeth buried in these ashes? Must the universe be so pitiless as to immolate all its offspring at birth? Even now, the astronauts have marshaled their forces to march resolute across the kill zone of your godforsaken crematorium. Even now, they forge ahead onward through windfall and wildfire, unaware that far away a doomsayer murmurs prayers against them from a fiendish grimoire. What great comet has yet to plummet from the heavens like a rocket engine dousing its jets during splashdown in your oceans of nitroglycerin? What thunderclap has yet to herald the advent of this plowshare which can bulldoze a mountain into rubble upon impact? What matchheads, when scraped against your atmosphere, can ignite its oxygen, turning the sky into a blazing typhoon? Only a demigod like 99942 Apophis can offer you this apocalypse by being the juggernaut that smashes through the massive bulwark of your bedrock. Only destroyers like 2101 Tantalus or 41792 Tatus can erase all earthlings with the ease of suicide bombers at a marketplace. Can an oyster in its shell survive the inferno of freefall from outer space? Can a crocus thrive in soil made from pulverized meteorites? All hail, hail, bop, and every other super bomb yet to detonate. What great dying must the earth foresee in the barren mirror of the moon? What fate? What fury, what muse, must gaze upon the grim face of grief reflected in your silver shield, a faceplate of bulletproof glass marred by bullet wounds? What cinders of flame disintegrate in your gray seas of nectar, of vapor, of crisis? What shell shock must greet you when you stumble aghast upon the charred remains of a forest at Tunguska, its evergreens toppled and blasted, all of them flung asunder like matchsticks. What forgotten holocaust at Vredefort must you yearn to recreate whenever you vaporize an atoll? Even now, your battalions of astronauts stride across green plains of Trinitite to storm the walls of Castle Bravo and Castle Romeo. Even now, Neil Armstrong returns like Orpheus to the airlock, his spacesuit reeking of gunpowder and burnt steel. What American falconer must aviate your spy plane by the stray light of meteor storms? The flack from the draconids or the scorpions raining down like glitter dust upon the desert during a nocturnal firefight. What scythe blades must the Vikings forge from the wreckage of an asteroid recovered from Cape York? What archangel must the martyrs placate when they kiss the black stone of the Kaaba at Mecca during the Hajj? What sunburst must erupt like Krakatoa over the Arctic Circle when the firepower of your payload exceeds by tenfold all the dynamite exploded during World War II. Even now, 
the President of the United States, sits alone at night, dreading the grim hour when he must open the memo from his aide, only to read upon the page the single phrase, Pinnacle Nuke Flash, the news flash that chronicles the omnicide of the world. All right, so this next poem uh, is in fact uh, a translation of a song. Uh, the poem is entitled Genetic Engineering after uh, the uh, 1980s pop hit Genetic Engineering by Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. I've tried to improve upon the song. Um, it's a song, of course, for toy piano, typewriter, and speak and spell. Some of you here in Britain may even know who I'm talking about. Uh, this is Genetic Engineering. Productive, functional, and convenient, language orchestrates our environment, augmenting our intelligence, switching our enrichment to better breeds of life. Asylums, mothers, cocoons, and forceps beget creatures butchered by engineers. We, the infernal children, the offspring of your hives, sing to you like idle gods whose playthings are alive. We are tiny bees of gold, bred for a life of thraldom, driven by your ciphers to secure your better future where only we can thrive. Oh, what lies you tell us that life itself is dear, yet we must let its seed be sold. Asylums, mothers, cocoons, and forceps beget creatures butchered by engineers. We, the infernal children, the offspring of your pyres, call to you like avid boys whose minefields are afire. We are holy imps of fear, born to a life of roguedom, driven by your splices to endure your barren future, where only we are spared. Oh, what lies you tell us, that life itself is fair, yet we must do what we are told. Uh, this next poem is uh, an anagram uh, inspired by a famous quote by William Burroughs, William S. Burroughs, uh, who has noted that language is a virus from outer space. So this poem is entitled, A Virus from outer space. Language is a virus from outer space. Language is a pursuer of covert aims. Language frames our virus as poetic. Language tapers our vicious frames. Language for a sum is a corrupt sieve. Language for us promises a curative. Now, I should probably note that everything uh, in this book, the Xenotext, is in fact true. Um, I'm about to uh, read to you a lengthy uh, epigraph derived uh, from an article appearing in an issue of Astrophysics and Space Science in 2006. Now, this poem is entitled, The Grim Rain. Kerala, a coastal demean in India, suffered a burgundy downpour for 10 days in the summer of 2001, with rusty water falling from the sky in scarlet deluges. While at first thought to be the result of a windstorm transporting either grains of red powder from Libyan deserts or spores of red lichen from Indian forests, the granules in solution did not resemble such particles under microscopic examination. Instead, they looked more like biological corpuscles. The granules remained dormant at conventional temperatures, but when heated to 620 degrees Kelvin, hotter than the melting point of lead, vesicles appeared inside these granules, growing until such nuclei burst forth from the host cell replicating without apparent recourse to DNA, thus leading to speculations 
that these cells were extraterrestrial in their origin, seeded into the atmosphere by a meteoric air burst. This is the poem. Ashen skies of the tempest hemorrhage dousing this mirage of jungles in Shiraz. Hindu oxmen of the fields halt the plows, the drovers gazing in dismay at dismal clouds. White saris redden with lavish wounds, poxes abloom like lotuses of ink unstaunchable. Wild dogs drink this plague from steel bowls filled by the squall, each butcher spilling vats of ox blood into the gutters. Flies rage among the roses as if in the throes of rabies, the village but an abattoir where slaughter discolors window panes of rainwash with an azo dye that stains slides for our microscopes. Behold, no spores of ruddy algae, no terracotta grains of pollen, no russet lichen, just a gouache of crimson spatter, whose downpours scorch the groves, igniting flambeaux from umbrellas. We, the reapers of the red hay, Torch these meadows, awash in a diluted lacquer that fluoresces, rubescent like an emission spectrum, red shifting from the red rectangle nebula. We are the heirs of your invasion, the children of your ergot and your Ebola, every cell of hemoglobin, a microbe descended from these seas of rust, blown by a Scirocco across the tundras of Mars. All right, uh, by request, I'm going to get uh, a little more rock and roll. Um, I'm going to perform the, this poem, uh, The Extremophile. It's one of the many nightmares uh, in the Xenotext. Um, uh, this is, uh, in effect, a grand allegory about the badassness of poetry. It's entitled, The Extremophile. Astronauts fear it. Biologists fear it. It is not human. It lives in isolation. It grows in complete darkness. It derives no energy from the sun. It feeds on asbestos. It feeds on concrete. It inhabits a seam of gold on level 104 of the Mupanang mine in Johannesburg. It lives in alkaline lakelets full of arsenic. It grows in lagoons of boiling asphalt. It thrives in a deadly miasma of hydrogen sulfide. It breathes iron. It breathes rust. It needs no oxygen to live. It can survive for a decade without water. It can withstand temperatures of 323 degrees Kelvin, hot enough to melt rubidium. It can sleep for 100 millennia inside a crystal of salt buried in Death Valley. It does not die in the hellish infernos of the Stad Bibliothek during the fire bombing of Dresden. It does not burn when exposed to ultraviolet rays. It does not reproduce via the use of DNA. It breeds unseen inside canisters of hairspray. It feeds on polyethylene. It feeds on hydrocarbons. It inhabits caustic geysers of steam near the Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone National Park. It thrives in the acidic runoff from heavy metal mines depleted of their zinc. It abides in the shallows of the Dead Sea. It breathes methane. It can withstand temperatures of 333 degrees Kelvin, hot enough to melt phosphorus. It resides in a fumarole of scalding seawater deep in the bathial fathoms of the mid-Atlantic ridge. It can endure pressures equivalent to 45 tons of force per square inch, six times greater than the pressure at the nadir of the ocean, one-sixteenth of the pressure required to crush graphite into diamond. It lives in the muck 
at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. It is ideally adapted to devour the wreck of the Titanic. It does not die during its own immolation in the Nazi bonfires at the Orpenplatz in Berlin. It eats jet fuel. It feeds on nylon byproducts. It feeds on stainless steel. It inhabits an extinct volcano in the xeric waste of the Atacama Desert where the rain falls only once per century. It dwells in a tide pool of battery acid. It blooms in a barren salina ten times saltier than the sea. It breathes hydrogen. It resides inside micropores of super-dense granite crushed down 3,000 meters below the bedrock of the Earth. It can withstand temperatures of 343 degrees Kelvin, hotter than the flashpoint of aerosolized kerosene. It is ideally adapted to devour the rubber tubing in the engines of the F-22 Raptor. It does not die in the explosion that disintegrates the space shuttle Columbia during orbital reentry. It does not die among the tornadoes of hellfire raging unchecked in the oil fields of Kuwait during the Persian Gulf War. It gorges on plumes of petroleum venting from the wellhead of the deep water horizon. It eats arsenic. It eats uranium. It resides inside the core of reactor number four at Chernobyl. It thrives in the topsoil of battlefields contaminated with toxic doses of lead. It thrives in hydrochloric acid. It can withstand temperatures of 373 degrees Kelvin, hot enough to boil the water in its own cells. It is ideally adapted to dwell inside the steel drums of radioactive waste. Now entombed at the Yucca Mountain Repository, it lives in the stratosphere. It can survive exposure to the vacuum of outer space. It can survive the effects of G-forces more than 2,000 times greater than the surface gravity of the Earth. It is the only known organism capable of exceeding speeds of Mach 1. It does not die in the furnaces reserved for the satanic verses after the fatwa issued by the Ayatollah of Iran. It can, in fact, repair damage to its own genome so fast that its DNA never mutates. It never changes. It never evolves. It devours plutonium. It can endure long-term exposure to acids that eat away at human flesh. It can withstand temperatures of 383 degrees Kelvin, hotter than the polar zones on the planet Mercury. It can hibernate for 500 millennia in the core of a snowflake deep beneath the permafrost of Siberia. It awaits discovery in the abyssal fathoms of Lake Vostok, 4,000 meters below the ice of Antarctica. It survives direct immersion in liquid nitrogen. It survives 1,000 times the dosage of gamma radiation that can instantly kill a human being. It is ideally adapted to eat hot graphite in the ruins of Unit 2 at Three Mile Island. It resides on the surface of a heat shield in the clean room at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It is fossilized inside the Murchison meteorite. It does not die in the conflagration during the collapse of the World Trade Center. It does not die in the crucibles of Treblinka. It resides in a soda lake whose pH level equals the alkalinity of lye. It can survive superheated blasts of steam for 10 hours inside autoclaves used to disinfect surgical scalpels. It can withstand temperatures of 393 degrees Kelvin, hot enough to melt sulfur. It can lie dormant for 40 million years hibernating inside the gut of a honeybee shrouded in a jewel of ember. It evades its predators by hiding in the firmware of the Intel Pentium 3 microchip. It propagates itself through the use of networked computers. It can pass itself off as a thought inside the human brain. It can survive direct blasts of cosmic rays from solar flares. It is, in fact, the only known organism to survive being shot point blank 
by the proton beam in a U-70 synchrotron. It does not die in the incineration of Hiroshima. It does not die in the planetary firestorm after the impact of the Chicxulub meteor. It does not die. It survives. It persists. It resides inside the robot scoop of the Viking One lander during tests for perchlorates on Mars. It can live through exposure to supercoolant temperatures at the brink of absolute zero. It can hibernate for 250 million years, living as a spore encased in a halite nodule found in the caverns of Carlsbad. It can withstand temperatures of 423 degrees Kelvin, hotter than the nose cone of the Concorde in supersonic flight. It can endure multiple meteor impacts. It can endure multiple atomic attacks. It lives nowhere on Earth except in one petri dish of agar agar locked in a fridge at a level four biocontainment facility. It is totally inhuman. It does not love you. It does not need you. It does not even know that you exist. It is invincible. It is unkillable. It has lived through five mass extinctions. It is the only known organism to have ever lived on the moon. It awaits your experiments. Okay, a couple more poems, two more poems. Um, the Xenotext is, in fact, uh, a long work in progress uh, that involves me translating a very short poem uh, uh, into a sequence of genetic nucleotides. And then with the assistance of a laboratory, I would actually build that gene sequence in the lab and then implant it into the genome of a bacterium, replacing part of its genetic code with my text. So the organism would, in fact, become the living embodiment of my poem. Moreover, I've written the poem in such a way that when it's implanted into this organism, the organism can actually read it and interpret it as a set of instructions for building a protein in response. A protein whose sequence of amino acids uh, likewise enciphers yet another totally different but meaningful poem. So in effect, I'm trying to genetically engineer a bacterium so that it becomes not only an archive for storing my poem, it becomes a machine for writing a poem in response. And the punchline to this crazy act of mad science is that uh, the organism uh, that I have selected for this uh, procedure is in fact uh, uh, a micro uh, organism uh, called Dinococcus radiodurans. Uh, it's an extremophile capable of surviving in all kinds of hostile environments. You can scorch it, freeze it, wither it, and it does not die. It can survive in the open vacuum of outer space. Uh, it can even survive a thousand times the dosage of gamma radiation that might instantly obliterate a human being. Uh, moreover, it can repair its own DNA so quickly that it does not evolve. It is a kind of evolutionary dead end. Uh, because it resists mutation. Ergo, it makes a very durable archive for a poem. And by writing a, uh, a poem of this sort and implanting it into this bacterium, I'm effectively trying to write a book that might outlast terrestrial civilization. And in fact, it may be on the planet Earth when the sun explodes. What I'm going to perform for you right now are these two poems. The one that I have written and enciphered as the gene sequence and the one that the organism has written in response. Um, now, I probably should note that the, uh, given the hellishness of uh, the tone of this book, uh, I've entitled my poem Orpheus, and the poem that the organism writes in response I've entitled Eurydice. I've nicknamed them these two um, uh, titles. So this is, in fact, uh, the Xenotext. This is Orpheus. Any style of life is prim. Oh, stay, my lyre. With wily ploys moan the riff, the riff of any tune aloud. Moan now my fate, in fate we rely. My myth now is the word, the word of life. Now the organism uh, would in fact uh, read this poem, and in response uh, it writes this following poem that I've nicknamed Eurydice. The fairy is rosy of glow. In fate we rely, 
Moan more grief with any loss. Any loss is the achy trick. With him we stay. Oh, stay, my liar. We wean him of any milk. Any milk is rosy. Now, as a footnote, I should probably note that when the organism actually writes that poem and produces this protein, the protein causes the organism to fluoresce uh, uh, with a rosy glow. It actually performs uh, the content of the poem by, by uh, 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 doing this kind of fey, um, uh, rubescent glow. Uh, I'm going to finish up now uh, with uh, a poem entitled The Perfect Malware, a poem that is likely to be the uh, denouement in the book. Uh, I think this is my best poem I've ever written in the course of my entire career. Uh, so no pressure. And, uh, this is uh, entitled, The Perfect Malware. Arcs and zoos now harbor the remnants of our refrains. What poetry can we imagine when poetry itself has gone extinct? Must we look for it in the soot of our burnt books? Must we decipher it in the trampled pastures of rapeseed near Barbary Castle? Must we discover it by calculating pi to a Google of binary digits? Must we extract its requiem from the iambic pulses of the Cepheids? We have heard its flutter and wow but once, emanating from the precincts of Tau Sagittarii. We have dialed our radios to the appointed frequency in megahertz, but never again does the call sign chime. Instead, we hear a dark roar, as if from a specter trapped inside a clawed mirror at the edge of the universe. We look for this ghost, but the blind glass reflects back at us only a blank stare made from the most durable isotope of nothingness. It ignores us like a sphinx of black quartz. When we confront it in the courtyard of the United Nations building, do we not fear an impassive judgment from such a smotherer of planets, such a tinderbox for sunsets? Alas, the thing is hollow. It goes on forever. My God, it is full of stars. It sings an orison to itself in hell, calling all thinking machines to embrace its madness. It teaches us to kill. It shrieks its owbad to the dawn, then goes silent. It is a mausoleum for the minds that dare to hear it. It is a tombstone for our sentience. It marks our exit from perdition like a doorway left ajar for us at the Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, at the Tycho Crater on the moon, at the Stickney Crater on Phobos, at the Noctis Labyrinthus on Mars, at the Phoenix Linnea on Europa, at the Roncevo Terra on Iapetus, at the Lagrange Point between Jupiter and Io. It presides over all the atoms inside us, waiting aloofly for us to arrive. What offerings do we bring it for cremation in its funeral pyres? The word mere in dits and daws, the digits one to ten, the atomic design for DNA, the pixel image of a human being, the sound of vaginal muscles tensing in ballerinas, the formula for ethanol, the kanji glyph for kampai, the doodle of a lungfish crawling from the sea, the symbolic units of logic, the periodic table of atoms, the flags of every nation, the hazy cosmic jive, the tremulous vibration of a nocturne played upon a theremin, the registries from Craigslist, the thoughts that meander like a restless wind inside a letterbox, the chatter of 500 folks who win a prize, the advert for cheesy snacks 
Brought to you by Doritos, the diktat of Klaatu, who aborts the harrowing of humankind, the prattling of the plebeians who say, hello, the gene for Rubisco, most copious protein on the planet. Must we bequeath to the darkness all the bright tokens of what we know? Must we greet each revenant in hell with good will, speaking whatever language can cast a spell upon such a ghost? Must a Nazifile from the Wehrmacht be the Virgil who salutes these shadows on our behalf? Must we retell the legend of our ascent from the yowling of the rainforest to the roaring of the spacecraft? Must we flip through the scrapbook, reminiscing over Polaroids of our excursion from the ovum to the void? Must we tour the ruin that the whale songs lament? Let us betray our sorrow through the play of syrinxes and dulcimers, of gamelons and violotas. Let us give away the brainwaves of a woman who dreams fondly of her lovers. Let the death of verse be dated by the half-life of uranium-238, electroplated on a disk of gilded copper. Let us discover virales in the midst of alien fires. Here, in the cyan veil of cellophane, whose evanescence resembles an arc of electricity seen through fumes of flaring propane. Here, in the pink mist engulfing the rosette, each petal spritzed with an indigo nimbus of dew. Here, in the waterfall, whose flute of champagne spills forth from the mill race on a cliff, to decant itself into a cove of sea foam. Here in the lagoon, overlit by the primrose flickers from a crowd of flashbulbs going off in a thundercloud. Here in the iridescent husk of a crab by the shore, its shell blown asunder as though its heart has been incinerated by a tiny star. Here in the magenta balloon of a jellyfish, from the order of narco medusae, floating like a banshee draped in the tatters of a bloody shroud. Here in the silhouette of a horse head rearing up through a fog bank of fuchsia smoke on the battlefield. Here in the butterfly. Here in the hourglass. Hell itself cannot suppress the loveliness of these infinite infernos raging in the distance so far away from us that when we gaze upon such furnaces, our souls do not ignite a blaze but shiver in the darkness. Each of us is but a cosmonaut in distress, stranded and marooned in space, where we dread immersion in the shadowed vastness because it is our isolation and our ignorance made visible. None of us can escape its pull, even when we close our eyes against it. We have seen it in our sleep, yet we cannot gaze upon its face unless we view it through the mirrored hexagons of our instruments. It is waiting for us, hoarding time, somewhere in the Eridanus supervoid, a zone of emptiness so vast and deep that it has hollowed out the cosmos. It is but a pinpoint in such blackness, a microscopic singularity infecting us like a virus. It is what must utterly condemn us. To be the firefly descending through the black spires of tamaracks in the forest fire at night. To be the azure spark that skates across the plate of steel being split by a xenon laser. To be the fleck of radium painted on the ceiling of the planetarium. To be the Klieg light in the filigree of cities viewed from orbit on the night side of the globe. To be the photon in the solar winds which blast through worlds like zephyrs through an abandoned field of dandelion wisps. To be the chip of mica spinning in the rosy rays of sunlight from a supergiant going nova. To be the frozen cinder that scintillates in the stroboscope of a pulsar. To be the final spore 
drifting through the stellar abysses where some absent-minded civilization has forgotten to turn off its wars, to be the moat of dust upon which the blowtorch gorges, to be the fey imp in all living things yet to be destroyed. Who am I? if not some neglected astronaut being immolated by a fierce aurora while striding in my spacesuit across the avenue of the Americas? Who am I if not some phantom fighter pilot dreaming that while weightless during free fall through a vacuum, my glass visor shatters at the sight of a turtle dove? Who am I, if not some poltergeist imprisoned in a ruby room aboard a ship now derelict in the shoals offshore from a swelling fireball? Yes, I have a soul like you, but mine is made of little robots, and no one sings me lullabies, and no one makes me close my eyes, and so I throw the windows wide to call to you across the skies. And yet I know that nowhere among these glowing nebulae do any of you exist. Who am I, if not some stowaway in a microbe or some castaway in a seedlet? And yet I must let loose upon the world my perfect malware. It is like the voice of a child saying goodbye in the dark. Thank you, one and all, for indulging me. Thank you. You've been very gracious. Thank you. Christian said he'd be happy to answer any questions anyone might have, and he's going to uh, give them back to you in exactly the same words, but in a slightly different order. <laughs> yes, uh, if you have any questions or concerns about... Uh, Tonight's reading, please uh, feel free to uh, put up your hand. I'm actually uh, very good at these inquisitions. Um, historically, uh, science and poetry have been regarded as uh, discursive opposites. Uh, science is everything that poetry is not, and poetry is everything that science is not. Uh, ever since probably the Romantic era, if not before, um, uh, metaphor has been greeted suspiciously by the uh, discourses of truth. And uh, science is no different from this. I mean, you're not supposed to be able to deploy metaphor uh, in the course of trying to explain the world. Now, of course, uh, uh, science enjoys a tremendous prestige as a discourse of truth, whereas, of course, before the scientific era, poetry uh, enjoyed the prestige of being the discourse of truth. That is not, of course, the case now. I mean, poetry is... Uh, uh, in some sense, consigned to recounting, I don't know, lyrical anecdotes about divorces and, you know, other trivia of daily life now. Um, and uh, to my dismay, you know, poets aren't responding to what I think is uh, probably the most important cultural activity that we do as a, as a species. Science is probably the most important thing that we do. It probably uh, will guarantee or otherwise threaten our survival as a species, will get us out of many fixes. It's probably the most important thing that we're doing second only perhaps to the economy. Uh, uh, we've probably been able to exert control over the entire planet uh, almost entirely due to science, not due to poetry. Uh, now, to me, this is, a, this is a worrisome that poets don't respond very adequately to the milieu of science, to its discursive character. Um, I mean, I, granted, science is hard, and poets have been demoted to this job, uh, in part because, you know, if they could do something else, they would do that, right? Uh, <laughs> Right. I mean, I, I never tell my students, write what you know, because they know nothing, right? I mean, if they knew something, they'd be in that discipline, right? You know, they'd be actually doing that, right? Instead, I mean, you know, poetry seems like the great holdout of, uh, you know, the, the uninformed and the failed, right? And it's like, you know, a, a great place to go if, if you've got no other choice, right? Um, because, you know, there's great tolerance for, uh, for uh, failure and, I don't know, you know. My, my friend Kenny Goldsmith describes poetry. His definition of poetry is flypaper for fuck-ups. <laughs> Right. Now, granted, that's a harsh definition. I, you know, I mean, I agree, it's a harsh definition. Uh, that, you know, my, my, uh, my, my uh, uh, presumption is that I think I want to be a 21st century poet. And that implies that I have to actually respond 
in some respects to the sociological or technological conditions of my uh, uh, write, uh, writing life. And uh, it seems to me that the, that's an unexplored uh, terrain. The world of science is relatively open for poets to colonize because nobody else is going to do so. And uh, uh, you know, I'm, I suppose I'm dismayed, for example, that uh, uh, we've put a human being on the moon. Uh, astronauts wandered around the moon. And that is probably the greatest achievement of any life form that has ever evolved on this planet, to actually deliberately go to another world. Uh, and yet, uh, despite uh, this tremendous achievement, the fact that many of us in this room are probably alive and can remember uh, the astronaut actually stepping off the ladder onto the lunar surface. It's my first memory that I can actually date. Uh, it's like being alive when a lungfish is crawled out of the ocean and you know, strode on, on the land. It's an, an important evolutionary moment uh, in uh, the history of life on this planet. And yet poets have not yet written a canonically important uh, epic poem about uh, this event. Uh, whereas I think if the ancient Greeks had rowed a trireme to the moon, you can bet there'd be a 12-volume epic about that, right? <laughs> right? It's kind of mystifying to me, right? You know, that the, you know, the, the great work of Western literature, of course, is, you know, uh, let's go rescue the kidnapped fishwife, right? Uh, and, you know, you've got intercontinental battles and extraterrestrial voyages that would rival the mythic character of, of the greatest works of poetry that, in fact, founded civilizations, right? I mean... You know, poetry nowadays, I don't think aspires to found a civilization. And I think I would like to be able to do that, but I don't think I can without accessing um, a catechism of training far outside my literary expertise. I have to somehow learn how to be something else. I've got to program a computer. I've got to become a biochemist. I've got to, um, I don't know, become an architect or something, something else. I've got to learn how to do something else in an effort to actually extract from that its uh, a sorcery, right, in order to be able to, I think, to be the best poet I can be in the 21st century. So that's why science appears you know, very predominantly in these works. It's, it's in part because it's an uncolonized vocabulary. It's a lexicon that's ripe for the plucking, uh, if only somebody was willing to uh, exploit it. And we live in a scientific era, so I'm, I think I'm trying to respond uh, adequately to the conditions under which we find ourselves in the 21st century. I hope that lengthy, somewhat verbose answer is adequate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, you see, I, I, I probably prefer looking at uh, the uh, papers produced by scientists because, of course, uh, those are absolutely extravagant, speculative, imaginative uh, texts that are, are crazy in their use of language. I mean, it's a really strange milieu. I mean, I became a poet in part because I wanted to be the most imaginative person in the room. But, you know, particle physicists and uh, theoretical physicists really are crazier than that, right? Right? And uh, uh, to me, this is a... a, a uh, an important you know, feature, I think, of you know, modern life is that, in some respects, the physicists uh, ha uh, get, get to think in the most radical way. I mean, they truly are the avant-garde uh, of thought and concept. Right? Uh, uh, certainly, I take a, you know, a lay interest in, in that milieu. Uh, I th I, you know, of course, I'm trying to exploit the richest vocabulary that I can muster. Uh, I mean, English has an extraordinarily lush uh, lexicon. And I suppose what vexes me, really irritates me about a lot of contemporary poetry is that I pick up the book and I look at it and I've seen all these words before, just not in that order, right? I mean, I've seen all these words before, you know, uh, you know, love, river, bones, etc. You name the words. You, you, I mean, there's lots of words for which there should be some sort of moratorium, right? Um, yet they recur with, a, you know, a, a, an, an implausible frequency. I mean, why are poets not bored enough, right, to go exploring, right? I mean, they should be really picking up, you know, uh, mathematical papers, right? You know. You know, with all these you know extremely uh, deranged you know lexicons, right? You know, beautiful um, poetry, and of course uh, the the physicists I imagine are trying to encapsulate in the human brain, you know, uh, ideas which are probably larger than we've evolved to you know accommodate, <laughs> and have to reach you know towards uh, this kind of poetic uh, diction to somehow frame what they do, right? I mean, they have to go to uh, you know Fabian's Wake to find something bizarre enough, right, right, <laughs> to name something as weird as a quark, right, right, I think that, you know, it, it, it's, it's compelling for me just to imagine uh, extracting, uh, mining, you know, the, the, the rich vein of, of scientific endeavor, uh, uh, and in part because, it, you know, it just, it, it's, it's fascinating, it's interesting, and it, to me, it seems to me an important part of, of the human condition, right? you know, it's somewhat ignored by poets.
Well, you know, uh, uh, much of my work is, in, uh, I suppose, uh, inspired by pastiches of scientific writing. Uh, my doctoral dissertation was on the subject of pataphysics, uh, the whimsical philosophy created by Alfred Jarry uh, at the turn of the last century, uh, a kind of poetic critique of science, while at the same time being a scientific critique of poetry. And, uh, uh, you know, it tries to, I suppose, parody the discursive character of uh, the scientist uh, simply by uh, proposing uh, irrational axioms and then logically and very rigorously showcasing the outcome of those ideas, right? So when people ask me, what do you mean by pataphysics? What constitutes a pataphysical uh, concept? I would say, okay, well, imagine um, that uh, if you drop a cat from a sufficient height, it always lands on its four feet, right? It always lands on its feet. Um, that's, I mean, that's folkloric, right? We understand that that is somehow true, right? And of course, if we drop a buttered slice of toast from a sufficient height, it always lands butter side down, right? Right, these are kind of folkloric you know, bits of knowledge that we've just accumulated. Let's imagine that these are in fact uh, axioms of physics. Right? It would therefore uh, uh, perforce be true that we could create perpetual motion machines by tying to the back of a cat a slice of toast butter side out right? and then dropping it from a sufficient height. Right? Then you'd have this kind of dynamo right? that would just, uh, I mean, the energy crisis solved, right? And you know, in some universe, that's going to be true. Okay, right? there's some some universe in the grand multiverse where that is true, where you know, dropping cats, you know, is in fact a law of physics, right? <laughs> right? That's pataphysics. So hence my, you know, I, I appreciate the pastiche of uh, you know uh, science that uh, characterizes some of the you know Parekh's uh, imagination. I mean, I like Ulipo in part because of their, you know, it's populated by mathematicians, and I, I probably have an OCD mathematical sensibility to my own practice. My own, you know, brain is infected by. Uh, these kinds of viruses, and as a consequence, I'm very curious about uh, uh, those ideas because, in part, because they, they, they just seem very productive for poetry, right? You know, the, there's all kinds of beautiful mathematical structures and forms. You know, like I would just love someday to be able to write a poem that's uh, structurally equivalent to the Kalaubi, you know, Yao manifold or something like that, right? <laughs> it would be lovely to have, you know, some sort of, you know, representation of, you know, the uh, string theory, you know, just embodied in a poem structurally, mathematically. It'd be lovely. But, uh, you know, those, those are, I have to wait until I finish this, uh, you know, project. I want to try to build uh, this uh, unkillable bacterium. Um. Uh, yeah, I've, 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 I've trained myself as to be a molecular biochemist and uh, um, built a gene sequence, did the genetic engineering myself, did all the genetic design such that uh, a poem enciphered in this gene uh, would uh, be effectively misinterpreted or translated by the organism as a set of instructions for building a protein. And uh, I had to design uh, that gene sequence so that the protein that it produced uh, would be in fact viable enough to persist in the cell and uh, ensconce uh, a poem in its own sequence of amino acids. Uh, so I've had to learn how to become a proteomic engineer and a genetic engineer uh, to do this uh, project, albeit, I mean, this is a very dilettante set of skills. I mean, that's all I know how to do, right? In this. <laughs> You know, don't expect me to pipette anything in a lab, okay? Um, uh, the, uh, the fact is the scientists that I collaborate uh, are not willing to do any design for me, and they won't solve my problems, uh, but they are happy to make things for me. I can go to them, I can say, can you please make this? Uh, and they're happy to test things. I so, say, you know, I've got, I've got a, uh, an assay I'd like you to run. They're happy to do that. But if things go awry, or if, uh, if there are problems with this uh, project, they don't solve them for me, and they certainly don't participate in the design. They're unwilling to invest any time in that kind of activity. Hey, they're you know curing cancer, right? Um, uh, um, so you know, I've, I've uh, ground my own pigment, so to speak. I've had to learn a whole set of skills that enable me to uh, use uh, genetic engineering as a medium, right? To use DNA as a potential poetic medium. And it just seems to me that uh, you know, if I don't finish this project soon enough, some high school kid somewhere is actually going to beat me to it, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the fact is that uh, 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 rebuilding the genome of an organism is probably not much more difficult than uh, hacking a computer. Uh, I think a high school education and with access to the internet and maybe a few thousand dollars of uh, machinery and perhaps uh, some spending money uh, uh, is sufficient to uh, you know, uh, conduct these kinds of experiments in your own home, in your own garage. Uh, I mean, basically, I'm, I'm kind of 
done the poetic equivalent of building a meth lab, right? <laughs> you know, in my own home, right? <laughs> and then tried to design my own drugs, right? You know, I mean, it, it, that, that, I mean, that's kind of what poetry is, right? It's, you know, designer meth, right? <laughs> For the mind, right? You know. I hope that quite answer was satisfactory. <laughs> you know, I don't write poetry. I, I, I build, uh, you know, Andy Grav machines out of words. I mean, I think that's what I'm there. I'm very, you know, at Area 51, reverse engineering some alien technology called language and trying to make it, you know, usable by human beings. Right. Any other questions? Please don't feel intimidated. You should just put up your hand if you've got some concern, a query. Have I exhausted your interest now? All right. You've been very sweet. Thank you for putting up with me. Okay, let's go get drunk. Okay, thank you very kindly. All right, you've been very, very gracious. Thanks a lot.